You've probably heard the term community organizing before. But what does it actually mean? And how can you get involved in the work of organizing communities? Let's find out. Let us now make our voices heard. I pledge to serve and to push my country. I pledge to live like a citizen. Welcome to Citizen University TV. I'm Eric Liu. This season on our show, we're exploring a very simple but profound question. What is civics? What do we mean by civics? Well, we define civics as the art of being a pro-social, problem-solving contributor in a self-governing community. And all those elements are important. Are you actually not antisocial and sociopathic? Are you thinking about problem solving and not just complaining about what's going on? Are you contributing and not just being on the sidelines? And are you part of a community that is capable of actually governing itself and not just being spectators? All of that is the art of civics. And in particular, today, we're looking at a dimension of civics that we call community organizing. Now, we didn't invent the term, but you've probably heard the term a lot in different ways. You've probably heard about it when Barack Obama first came on the scene because he'd cut his teeth as a community organizer in the south side of Chicago. Here in Seattle this year, we're celebrating a 50th anniversary of Seattle's Black Panther Party, who were, of course, uh, archetypal uh, community organizers. And then right now, in the International District in Chinatown, uh, a coalition is organizing under the hashtag Humbows, Not Hotels, another form of classic community organizing. But to understand the idea and the work of community organizing a bit more concretely, we wanted to give it a definition here. And the definition is simply this, mobilizing people where they live to solve problems together. Now, all those pieces are important, actually being able to bring people together in a way that's rooted in place, and again, in a way that's focused on solving problems. There are three dimensions to this work of community organizing that we want to talk about today. Number one, framing the fight. Number two, organizing with story. And then number three, making a ladder of goals. Let me kind of unpack each one of these here. So first of all, framing the fight. What do I mean by that? Well, on any issue that you might want to organize around, whether it's simply a thing about what's going on in your street and whether to have a speed bump or not, uh, or it might be something at the scale of the city or, or beyond, uh, about taxation, about affordable housing, it's always about trying to frame up what is the debate, what is the argument, what are the stakes here, and why do you want to get people to join, to step off the sidelines on your side of that fight? So right now in Seattle, there's a fight going on between, for instance, folks who want to uh, pass what they call a progressive business tax and their opponents who want to call it a jobs tax. Uh, these folks on this side want to frame it as something for housing affordability and, and making this place a more affordable place to live. Uh, folks on this side say uh, the tax is about killing jobs and killing uh, business and dynamism in the Seattle economy. That whole frame, depending on what side you're on, uh, is an intentional choice about how to invite people in to the fight. So that framing is super important. The second, then, second piece, then, is organizing with story. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, the great community organizer Marshall Gans, who actually mentored, among others, uh, people on the Barack Obama campaign of 2008, talks about there being three stories at the heart of community organizing, a story of self, a story of us, and a story of now. So when you're out there trying to bring people into the fold, for instance, on a given cause, whether it is uh, transit or neighborhood development, whatever it might be, how do you tell a story about why you got involved in this, why you care, and why this matters to you, so that there's some sense of passion that can be contagious? But then moving to this idea that this is a bigger story of us, that you and I share this cause, this concern, this sense of frustration about the direction of our fill-in-the-blank, our community, our group, our neighborhood, our place, right? That bigger story of us that we've got a common cause. And then finally, the story that is about the fierce urgency of now. Why is this the moment that we have to actually think of ourselves as a we and organize and activate together? Being mindful of how you build narrative like this is not just about words and storytelling, it is the way in to organizing communities at every scale. Well then finally, most important, once you've done those first two pieces of framing the fight and organizing this story, it's having this ladder of goals. So you may want, if you're organizing, for instance, in Chinatown, an international district, you may want as your overarching goal to preserve the historic and ethnic cult uh, character uh, of that community. 
Uh, but right now, there are probably specific fights first. There might be a particular development uh, that you on the ground want to push back against to make sure uh, that the longtime residents of the neighborhood get to stay there. And if you're successful in that, or maybe even if you fail in that, that builds momentum uh, and capacity to go on to the next rung, which is to think about how do we get the city council to protect and designate areas of this neighborhood uh, to be off limits to development. That may move you to a next step too, which is how do we bring in more folks into this community who have some respect or connection to its historic character uh, and ethnic history, so on and so forth. Building a ladder of goals like this so that it's not just going from zero to, I wanna make this a great place. How do I actually build those steps in? That ladder of goals can also be even super tactical about how do I first build a list of people? How do I get those people who, who join that list to take small actions? How do those small actions then repeat into bigger steps together? Having that sense that your first step actually leads to more is a big part of what we think of in community organizing. So just to recap, in our notion of community organizing, remember there are three important dimensions. In the first place, frame the fight in a way that can bring people in. Secondly, organize with story in those three stories we talked about of self, us, and now. And then finally, build a ladder of goals that brings you from the near term to the longer term, from the merely tactical to the more strategic. Now, let's think about and look at how this work of community organizing actually plays out in our community here in Seattle, particularly among immigrant communities. To do that, we're gonna look more closely at the Somali Family Safety Task Force. Sixty-nine percent of Muslim women who wore the hijab reported at least one incident of discrimination. The hijabs and harassment came at the request of the women in our community. I can say every woman that I've talked to in the Somali community who wears hijab has been harassed at some level, either spit on or had their hijab pulled off, um, or in some cases like violently attacked. My name is Jessica Schreindel and I'm the program coordinator with the Somali Family Safety Task Force. It's important to document and to report. I'm a Somali American, I'm a Muslim black woman. I'm leading part of the training around what are our rights as, um, as Muslims, as women, and how do we protect ourselves in case um, in, in case something does happen. My name is Nimko Balale and I'm an education program manager at One America. Oftentimes there's fear in the community around like reporting, um, there's um, complicated relationships with law enforcement around who to report to and specifically with our, the Somali community, not just with them not only being Muslim but also being black and immigrant. We've been targeted a lot. Even the people, they don't know you. Just like you wear for your hijab. I'm Afrahia Mohammed, Executive Director of the Somali Family Safety Task Force. By myself, I came as a refugee this country. Then the I see gap. We have a lot of need. So everybody come to the table. We make all of us decision together. But we are advocating to our families, education, and then how to survive when you come to this country. So a lot of the programming that we do definitely is different um, because we're serving refugee and immigrant populations. Um, for example, the sewing class, um, it's not just for women to get together and sew and learn the skill of sewing. It's actually, it was created to reduce isolation. Some of them, the work we do is a volunteer. We don't have a lot of staff, we don't have a lot of money. I recruit like not one person, two, three, four people. If two people they cannot make it, at least two other people they will come. So that's what we do. It's really nothing fancy. For the most part, it's word of mouth. And I think when we tell people that, they're always kind of like, it can't just be word of mouth, but it really is. If you have more funding and then the strong board, you can do everything. And then the staff who de dedicate it to. So I think what's really most critical as far as community organizing is that it needs to come from the community, it needs to be community-led as well. It's not a matter of one way is better than the other, it's what works best for the community. So that's really why we've been successful, it's, it's relationship-based ultimately. The people, they have to trust you. And then if it's the people, they need you, you have to be there. For a deeper dive now into the work of organizing, we're joined by Katie Wilson, who's the General Secretary of the Transit Riders Union here in Seattle. Katie, welcome. 
Thank you, Eric. So uh, tell us about the Transit Riders Union and what, uh, what you all do. Well, we're the Transit Riders Union, so we organize Transit Riders. We're a um, membership organization, um, and you know we meet every month and decide what campaigns we want to take on. We've uh, been around for around six years. Uh, we've done a lot of work around making the public transit system affordable and accessible to everyone. Um, and in the last couple of years, we've uh, sort of broadened our horizons and, and begun to work on issues uh, from progressive taxation to housing and homelessness. So uh, you were describing to me before the cameras started rolling how when you and, and a few others started to get this organization off the ground around 2011, um, by your own admission, you didn't really know what you're doing, right? Uh, you, you were kind of figuring it mm -hmm. out as you went along. Yep. Um, in those, the early years of the union's work, how did you... Um, what did you have to learn? What did you have to figure out? What did you uh, learn the hard way? Yeah, um, school of hard knocks. You got to be prepared to fail and fail and fail if you want to uh, do this work successfully. Um, so, um, yeah, organizing. I would say um, maybe the best way to explain what organizing is is to contrast it with a couple of other things that you need to do to win campaigns. So, um, one thing is coalition building, right? So if you have an organization, um, if you want to do something big, uh, you probably can't do it alone. So you need to reach out to other organizations that might have um, you know, similar vision or mission um, and uh, you know, put together a coalition that can, uh, that can get something done. Um, but of course, just a list of organizations isn't enough to get anything done either. So you actually need, if you're trying to get something, um, you know, trying to get the city to do something or the county to do something, you need to demonstrate that there's really strong public support, that a lot of people are, are watching and want to see this happen. Um, and so the, another thing that you do is you mobilize. You have, you know, get on the megaphone and uh, reach out to the people in your orbit. Um, say, you know, come out to this meeting at City Hall, come out to this event, um, you know, email, call your council members. So coalition building and mobilizing, um, really important things to win campaigns, um, but that's not organizing. Um, that's sort of shifting around the forces that already exist. Um, it's important, you need to do that, but um, organizing is something different. Organizing is, on the one hand, um, bringing in new people. Um, so that's going out, talking to people on the street, you know, knocking on doors, um, and you know, talking to people who might not agree with you, people who are not part of any organization. Um, and um, it's really about building new power um, and also really just building new um, civic infrastructure. And mm. that's something that I think is um, you know, particularly important today when um, people are connected in a lot of superficial ways. But um, you know, I would say that the vast majority of people are not really deeply involved in civic organizations that um, you know, or have the power to put forward and, and push through um, policies. So when uh, the Transit Riders Union was g getting going, one of the first fights that you uh, dived into was to try to preserve the uh, uh, downtown free ride zone, right? Yeah. Um, tell me how that went and what you learned from that initial experience and kind of what you did with the learnings from it. Sure. So, um, yeah, I mean, we, we went out there and, uh, you know, talked to transit riders uh, downtown. We did a petition and, you know, had people sign this petition, um, you know, got thousands of, of signatures. And, um, you know, when we started, we didn't on, even... On the last day of the, when, when the free zone was going to end, right, mm -hmm. you all did a, a, a big public... We did a, a funeral march, funeral. yeah, funeral <laughs> march down down, uh, down 3rd Ave. Um, and, you know, we presented our, our petition to Larry Gossett came down from the county council to receive our petition. And, um, you know, we didn't win that campaign, um, but what we, what we did was build a lot of momentum um, that ended up allowing us to win uh, the low income reduced fare, the Orca Lift program. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think, you know, we learned a lot about the mechanics of organizing from that campaign. When we'd first started out, we didn't even realize, like, when you talk to someone, you know, you got to try to get their contact information so you can follow <laughs> up with them and, you know, invite them to a meeting or an event, right? We just thought, like, oh, you just put the word out and people do things. Um, so I think we had a lot to learn about um, just how active you have to be and how, how much initiative you have to take in, um, in really bringing people into a movement and uh, creating the space where people can um, sort of, you know, learn about an issue and come to see it as their issue um, and, uh, and really, you know, be, become committed to, to a cause. But, but it's also even at the most tactical level you're describing, if you take step one, you already have to have step two or three in mind, right? If, if you got people in the first place to show up, 
um, not only capturing their name and their contact info, but giving them a couple of things they could mm. do next, right? Yes, uh, yep. Um, so, so what were some of those early examples when you realized, holy cow, we got a lot of people here. Uh, we, we should give them something else to do. Yeah, um, uh, that's, that's hard. And I mean, another example of that is, um, uh, you know, last year after Trump got elected, there was all this energy of people, like, I want to do something, I want to do something. Um, and, um, you know, out of that, we were able to sort of capture some of that energy um, and we we partnered up with the Economic Opportunity Institute and uh, built the Trump Proof Seattle Coalition um, and uh, ended up winning the first uh, municipal you know, progressive income tax, the first income tax in Washington state in over 80 years. Um, and uh, you know, that was a case where we had all these volunteers who wanted to do something. And the challenge for us was how do we, how do we use all this energy and really direct it toward, um, toward, a, toward a goal? Um, and um, you know, we got people emailing, calling council members. We organized um, town halls in every district, working with some other grassroots organizations, um, and really got volunteers engaged in organizing those events and, and reaching out in their neighborhoods to bring people in um, into this effort. Now, um, I know a lot of uh, what's currently on the plate for you at, uh, at uh, the Transit Riders Union is um, our larger issues of taxation in the city, and we'll get to that in a second. Mm -hmm. But um, back to the kind of core work around transit, um, a lot of that is neighborhood-based, place-based, right? Questions about bus mm -hmm. service or about uh, places in, in the city where there's a particularly high proportion of people who need and use mass transit. Yeah. Um, tell me how you think about these questions of organizing in a, in a place-based mm. way, right? Because yeah. the identity of transit rider, it, it transcends all neighborhoods. Mm. And yet, when you get right down to it, it really is rooted in, in place in some yeah. ways, right? Yeah, I mean, often people will um, contact us because they have a particular concern with their bus route um, or you know, bus stops in their neighborhood. And so we've done a lot of um, yeah, supporting people and, and um, groups in neighborhoods to, to try to get those, those issues um, sorted out. Um, but there's, I think, also a bigger sense in which the work that we do is uh, geographically based because um, we're fighting for political things. So we're trying to get you know, the city council to do something or the county council to do something, or sometimes the state legislature to do something. Um, and uh, that means that um, we're really targeting, putting pressure on uh, elected officials, um, and their districts are geographic, right? So if we're trying to get the city to pass some kind of legislation, um, you know, there's seven city council districts. And so we're organizing people on that district basis um, to uh, put pressure and support behind their elected official uh, to, you know, to vote yes or to champion some piece of legislation. So um, right now, uh, as we sit here, um, you're, you're in the midst of this uh, uh, debate that is not just uh, uh, local news, it's national news mm. uh, uh, about what you're calling the progressive, uh, uh, well, you're, t tell me the pr progressive business progressive tax. Progressive business tax. Uh, it has many the, names, but that's And the one opponents of uh, are, are calling it uh, uh, the jobs tax or the head tax. Yep. Uh, um, uh, putting aside the questions of framing and the language there, mm -hmm. um, Tell me how you're going about trying to organize, as you by, by your definition, people who aren't currently participating, yep. um, to participate in this particular fight around uh, around taxes in order to fund. Uh, how affordable housing and services for the homeless. Sure. So, um, I mean, one of the tools that we use and that I think is a sort of a standard organizing tool is, is a petition, an organizing petition. So we go out on the street, um, uh, go to events, and, you know, stand on the street corner, talk to people, um, get them engaged in this issue, and then if they support it, they sign our petition. Um, we invite them to, you know, give us their email address, phone number, and then we follow up with them um, and uh, and try to get them, you know, more engaged in the campaign try to get them emailing, calling council members, try to get them to come to our events. And that's really how we grow. Um, and the thing about organizing is that, um, you know, when you're doing a campaign, that doesn't always feel like the best use of your time. Mm. Um, often just mobilizing, getting on the megaphone, you know, putting stuff on Facebook, doing email blasts, it's, it feels a lot easier. Um, organizing is hard work. It's slow. Um, you have to, it's, it can feel sometimes like uh, searching for a needle in a haystack, right? Mm. You, you go and you talk to 100 people and, and maybe only a handful actually get involved. Um, so it doesn't always feel like the thing that you should be doing, but it's so important because that's the only thing that really grows your organization, that grows a movement, so that the next campaign you take on, you're starting from a stronger position. Hmm. Um, and um, it's, it's the, real, the real work that needs to be done. Uh, well, Katie, thank you so much for telling us about your take on, on the question of organizing. And I guess the, the, the very last thing I want to say, because we're almost out of time here, uh, or ask is uh, 
uh, rewind, if, uh, if the you of 2011 walked in here, right, and you're like, okay, Katie, don't make these mistakes, right? Or if there's a viewer out there who's thinking, I wanna get involved in organizing. Yeah. Um, what are the first one or two, three things you would tell that person who knows nothing about organizing except mm. has a desire to wanna get engaged? Yeah. Uh, what would you tell them to do, real quick? Wow, that's a big question. I mean, I think that just uh, persistence yeah. is the most important thing. I mean, there's there's um, a lot of different qualities, I think, that can make someone a successful organizer, but the most important thing is that, like, this is the thing that you're gonna do, and you're gonna figure it out. So just keep trying. That's, that's the, the big message, I think. That's great. Katie, yeah. thank you for uh, joining us today. Thank you. My guest today has been uh, Katie Wilson. She's the General Secretary of the Transit Riders Union here in Seattle. We're defining community organizing as mobilizing people where they live to solve problems together. And remember, this work is deep in the American DNA. It is part of our civic history, both at the national level and the local level. If you think about the history of the civil rights movement, so much of that was about effective community organizing, mobilizing people who were spread apart and disaggregated and helping them generate new power out of thin air by showing up together. In the life of our city, the history of what's called the Four Amigos, Uncle Bob Santos, Bernie White Bear, Larry Gossett, and Roberto Maestas, who starting in the late 60s and early 70s began to do community organizing all across the city to change the frame of the possible about fights for social justice and racial justice in Seattle. Their legacy lives on today in the fights that are unfolding right now in our city about displacement and gentrification and housing. This is a map about uh, of the city in which there are all kinds of debates about density and how we're gonna make this a place that's affordable for all. These questions about how do you mobilize neighborhoods, how do you organize people and activate them to fight for more affordability and access or to fight to preserve the character of a particular part of town, all of this work happens through the nuts and bolts of showing up, inviting people in, participating in this kind of work of basic community organizing. We started this episode with this overarching question of what is civics? And we define civics as the art of being a pro-social member of the community in a self-governing community. But fundamentally, one of the core pieces of civics is this work of community organizing. It's not as, it's not as sexy as running a campaign. It's not as visible sometimes as doing things like marching or protesting. But this bread and butter work of saying to folks who are on the sidelines, would you like to get involved? Would you like to understand more about this issue? Could you join us on this list? Could you be part of this growing movement? That work is the essence of building civic power and being effective in civic life. Well, every episode uh, on the show, we love to take questions from you that come in via social media. And so we've got a couple of great ones today. This first one that came in via Twitter from Pat uh, Patricia uh, says this, my college students found it disturbing that you chose the word citizen with all the baggage that word carries. Thoughts? Well, this is an important question because the name of this show is Citizen University TV. The name of the organization I run is Citizen University. And so I wanna say a word uh, about this. First of all, when we use the word citizen, I'm not talking only about documentation status under the immigration and naturalization laws of the United States. I'm talking about a bigger, more capacious ethical sense of being a member of the body, being a contributor to community, being, as I said earlier, a non-sociopath. Both of these dimensions matter. The, the legal category does matter, but so does this bigger ethical notion, right? And the reason why I make that distinction is that in our country right now, there are many people who lack the papers of US citizenship and yet live like big citizens in this more ethical sense. And conversely, there are a lot of people who, who do have the papers, but don't live like big citizens. And so making that distinction is important. But it's also important, I must say, to say that the word citizen itself is not something to run away from. There are immigration debates where there's nativism right now, where there's anti-immigrant sentiment, but that doesn't mean that the word citizen is invalid. Actually, I think it's a moment right now in our country's history where it's super important to name and to claim that word and to say that, yes, this category does matter, but let's not use the category, the legal status, as some kind of club to beat people up with, but to ask ourselves, those of us who are lucky enough to have that status, to say, what does it mean? What does it obligate us to do? What do we owe community and country, those of us like me who had the dumb luck to be born here and get that status, or those of you who have naturalized to attain that status? The word citizen is something that matters because in a polity, 
in a self-organizing community, in a democracy, we have to choose together what actually constitutes the community. And so if you show up in all these different ways, not being afraid to run away from the word citizen is really important. The second question that came in, also very interesting in a very different way from Shauna on Facebook, uh, and I'll read it to you here. It's kind of long, but it's important. Shows like The West Wing, Madam Secretary, and The Good Fight engage and entertain millions while helping them imagine the people behind and within the power structures of our country. What's the next great TV show America needs? Or are these shows getting in the way of real activism? It's a pretty interesting question because as somebody who's enjoyed some of these shows, I do think, wow, wouldn't it be great if we had shows like that right now? Of course, my first reflexive answer is we have such a show. It's called Citizen University TV. Our show is what millions of people should be watching right now. But putting that to the side, if you think about shows that are actually more entertainment-like, well, there ought to actually be a show, a sitcom, it could be a more serious show that's based on a community organizer. Imagine a show like Parks and Rec, but all about local community organizers. The opportunities for both dramatic and comedic storylines are, uh, are infinite. But I think my deeper answer actually goes to the second part of Shauna's question. Are these shows getting in the way of real activism? You know, I've been thinking about this a lot lately because in this age of Trump, I often see people commenting on social media or just hear it in conversation, oh, well, who should play President Trump when they make the movie of this era? And we as Americans already have this kind of too fast reflex to make things meta, to make them about entertainment, to think of this whole thing that we're living through right now as just another form of entertainment. People talk about the Trump show, the way they might've talked uh, about the movie, The Truman Show, right? But this is not reality TV. This is not for fun. This is not entertainment. And I think there is a way in which our lens of entertainment gets in the way, as Shauna says, of real activism, of real community organizing, of really showing up in a face-to-face -face way to listen to people, to learn the issues of a community, and to figure out how we're gonna solve problems together. I do think it's important for us actually to be able to turn off those screens when they're all about entertaining us and titillating us and thinking about, okay, how do I look around the community that I'm situated in and make things happen? Well, we hope that you'll send us more of your questions and ideas and comments, and you can do that through all these different channels, hashtag CitizenUTV. You can reach us uh, through our Twitter handle there or email us directly at contact at seattlechannel.org. And of course, you can find us on Facebook as well. Well, that wraps this episode of Citizen University TV. We hope you'll join us next time as we dive deeper into the question this season, what is civics? I'm Eric Liu. Thanks for joining us and tune in again.